Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another edition of the Gaming Careers Podcast. On this show, sometimes we talk about gaming careers, sometimes we talk about how to make the gaming widget or project, and sometimes we talk about the gaming business in general. Today we are talking to JT Smith from The Game Crafter, who is an expert in all three. Thanks so much for being with us on the show today, JT. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So uh, we have a lot to talk about. And so to help calibrate our audience, who are you and who is this Game Crafter person? <laughs> I am JT Smith. I am the owner of the Game Crafter, among other things, or one of the owners of the Game Crafter, I should say. The Game Crafter is a print-on-demand studio for publishing your own board games. So if you have a board game design, you upload some artwork to our website, uh, and then we will produce a professional copy for you and send it to you in the mail. Uh, and minimum run of just one copy, which is fairly unique. Normally, you have to get you know a thousand copies made or something. Right, right. So how did that start? I know that uh, on some of your promotional materials, you're talking about this is one of the very first you know, web to print um, services, Quantity One, or I think you are the first, um, mm -hmm. maybe the only for Quantity of One. Uh, anyway, how'd you get involved in that? Well, I, uh, I used to write a lot of uh, business software for people, and it was kind of boring. <laughs> and I was always, I'm always looking to challenge myself. So I start a lot of little hobby businesses and things like that and see what happens. And the Game Crafter was one of them. I convinced my business partners that instead of writing these web apps for uh, a bunch of corporate clients, maybe we should create this thing where we can make games. And they thought I was insane. Uh, and I was, I mean, it, it's a silly idea, but it, it worked. Um, so we basically just, you know, set up the web service and people started using it. And we thought if if 100 people a month were buying games off of it by the end of the first year, we'd be really happy with this little hobby business. And it was, you know, we had almost 300 people buy games in the first month. So it was a lot. That's awesome. Okay, so let's rewind a bit into some of that boring stuff. So um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's often said that it takes uh, uh, 10 years to make an instant success, right? So right. Rewind the clock. Um, who were you as a quote unquote real lifer that <laughs> kind of equipped you to do this? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, backing up way back, um, I was the director of technology at a Fortune 500 company called Brunswick. Uh, they're a holding company that owns Brunswick Bowling, a bunch of uh, boating companies like Mercury Marine, that sort of thing. And um, I, at that time, I had also started a a uh, little open source application called WebGUI, which is a, a content management system. And uh, that was really taking off. There are a lot of people out there using it and, uh, and a lot of companies uh, started asking to contract my time for support or custom features or whatever. So I decided to quit my day job and go you know, work on WebGUI full time. And so that's kind of you know my software background is it, you know, working for the corporate world and then transitioning to run my own software company, which eventually uh, transitioned into all of the consulting services that Plain Black does today. So I still own that company. That and Plain Black is the company around WebGUI, the content management system. Yeah, and and for our listeners, there's a big long list, so uh, I'll have all of those in the show notes with links to them, and and you can see JT in quote unquote real life. It's very scary. Um, so. <laughs> Um, so going back uh, from there, I, I know that um, I, I also had an interview with um, Jeff King from All Us Geeks. I, I listened yep. to his show. I listened to uh, the Game Crafter podcast. Both of those are going to be as uh, listed as resources in this show uh, uh, show notes. But um, we talk about, or you guys talk about, um, gamers are in education or technology. Coding. Uh, it seems like you come from uh, coding as a, a as a background. What did you originally want to do with coding? Was it like I, I want to be a gamer, but I got sucked into corporate first, or are you like corporate's my thing, and and you just discovered this later? <laughs> Neither, actually. Um, so I I started programming when I was very young. Uh, it, it probably I don't know third grade or something like that. Maybe even younger than that. Um, and it was just very interesting to me. I got a, I got this magazine that hasn't existed for 20 years called Byte Magazine. And in the back, they would have uh, programs that you could type in to your 
crappy computer and uh, <laughs> and it would do something. And this is before hard drives even. So that's how old I am. Um, but anyway, the uh, so I was interested in that sort of stuff, but I wasn't going into it for a career because I'm not very good at math. And usually to pass a CS degree, you have to have math. Um, so I went into college going into television engineering, which you'd think would be more math, but it's actually less math. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so that's what I was doing, and I was working as the chief engineer at a television station uh, along about uh, 1993, 1994, something like that, when the web started taking off. And I decided we needed a web page for the TV station, so I built one, and then kind of everything spiraled from there. I got really hooked on web programming and, and then you know broke off and went to start uh, one of my first companies with, with another group of people, financiers, uh, called Web Team. And uh, I don't know, just from there, we just kept going. And eventually, like I said, we went to Brunswick and then built my own software consultancy and the whole nine yards. Right, so. right. So um, this is something that we often hear on the show as well. Like, uh, what was the path? And step one, step two, step three was not going to college and getting a degree and then going and doing an interview process. And then, I mean, almost everybody that I've talked to has organically gotten into whatever discipline that they have. And I don't know, like maybe in the, the next hundred shows or so, maybe it won't take me that long. I'll just decide to stop the podcast because there's no secret sauce. I can't find it. Uh, it's just uh, about people kind of finding their own degrees or finding their own path in the gaming industry. Yeah, I, I think that... I think that you just have to have a, a desire and then the drive to push forward with that. I think that's the secret sauce. It isn't It isn't any like one starting point. Everybody comes from other, all, all different kinds of disciplines. I think it just starts off with any business owner. If you have passion and you have the drive to actually use that passion for something, that's how you succeed. And, and it doesn't matter if that's in gaming or anything. So... That's, right. I mean, every business I've started, regardless of whether or not it was in gaming, it was about, I was excited or passionate about the thing, and I put every ounce of effort I had into that thing. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about just uh, web GUI for a second, because I want to kind of calibrate our listeners. I know that a lot of our listeners are, are aspiring game devs. Uh, many of them have computer science degrees. They have the foo. They have the magic that they can mm -hmm. apply. Um, what brought that about? How, why did you decide that the uh, web GUI was something that you wanted to apply your um, passion towards? It was, um, <laughs> I was building lots of websites uh, prior to that, and they all had a lot of stuff in common back then. You needed, you know, a way to log in, you needed a poll, you needed a forum, uh, whatever it was, you know, the different features of a site back in those days, you needed a blog. Um, and I was sick of rebuilding the same crap over and over and over again. So I just said, okay, I'm going to standardize this on a set of widgets and we're going to call it web GUI. And then I, when I need to whip up another site, I've got a really nice fixed starting point that gives me all the bells and whistles I need. So I can actually just do the little custom bits that I need for that particular site. That was it. It was just a uh, uh, laziness really. <laughs> Hey, um, the the uh, platform uh, Web GUI and other um, content management systems that are out there is what allows the whole rest of us that are not programmers to be able to access the web in that way. I use um, a a competitor, uh, a WordPress blog, Gosh, yep. darn. but um, it's I have no I have I I'm so embarrassed. Uh, I have absolutely no magic or foo or anything anything like that. It is stuff that you put together that is th those widgets. And mm -hmm. basically now uh, the complete uninitiated has uh, the option of getting involved in a web presence using some pretty sophisticated tools that I don't need to know anything about. I can just right. yeah. widgetize. Um, okay, so you you had this, this platform, you're starting to get people say, hey, can you uh, expand with feature requests? Uh, can, I, can, can I contract out? So you knew that you had a little bit of, um, some traction there to be able to potentially jump out on your own. Mm -hmm. How did you make the decision to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ditching corporate and I'm, I'm going to be a independent contractor for these folks. Well, uh, that was actually over a period of time. I didn't immediately do it. Um, what happened was I started getting contracts and I was doing them myself. And then I started getting so many contracts that I couldn't do them all myself and do the day job 
So instead of quitting the day job, I actually hired contractors that I could subcontract to. That's fantastic. And, and then built the business up that, that way to the point where uh, I knew I had enough money coming in to support myself if I quit my day job. So that's uh, that's the kind of iteration of how it went. And that whole process took about two years. So okay, that's still I was really using that's still a really small amount of time uh, in the grand scope of things. Um, sure. So I, I want to um, kind of focus on that a little bit because that's fascinating to me that you you didn't just say, okay, I'm going to take the leap. You actually kept the day job and outsourced. How did mm -hmm. you go about finding those folks to outsource? Because this is kind of where we are in, in society right now, outsourcing while you have a full-time job that's that you're basically paying other people, even if it's not initially as a, at a profit, to build mm -hmm. a business is is some good good advice. Absolutely. Um, so in that case, it, actually in every case, uh, when I build a business, I generally build a community around that business, a community of customers, a community of fans, uh, a community of modders, you know, people that if it's code based, people that want to actually contribute to the code, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. And so um, that's I basically just drew from the community that I had built. There were people out there that were writing code and submitting patches and stuff like that for for web GUI. So I simply said, Hey, do you want to do a contract job? And they said Yes. And we went forward from that. <laughs> okay, well, th that uh, strikes on a uh, a great point to to uh, mention. Uh, Web GUI is open source, then. That's correct. Yes. Okay, so that's kind uh, of one of the things that allowed you to build a community. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't have a marketing budget or anything like that. This my foot in the door with places was the fact that it's free software. So I'm giving away the software. Uh, and that allows people to mod it and do whatever they want with it, but it also allows people to install it uh, at their business and get up and running. And then when they either encounter a problem that they can't solve or they need a feature that they don't know how to add, that's when they would contact me. Okay, and what kind of business decision did you make when going into that? Did you always want to have it open source, kind of want to add to the fabric of great free resources that are out there? Or was there uh, something that said, okay, well, I, I want to hold on to it in case I can develop my intellectual property, I can package it up and sell it to big corporations? Yeah, I, I'm a pretty big believer in open source. I mean, it's not like every piece of software needs to be open source or anything like that. But I I really appreciate all of the work that um, people put into all the programs that I use every day. I use a lot of open source uh, software. So in that respect, I just wanted to, um, you know, give back a little bit. And I had contributed patches to a lot of different other applications before I'd done that. Um, but uh, there was also a practical reason by open sourcing it, uh, and this isn't the reason I did it, but there is a, it would apply to some of the listeners. Um, if you open source it, you're not making any money off of it technically. So you're not selling the software. A lot of companies will write into their into your contract with them that anything you create under their tenure or under your tenure with them is their property. Um, so there's this intellectual property going on where who owns the software and by open sourcing it, it doesn't matter because it's open source. Anybody can use it for free. So I'm not selling the software. I'm selling my services outside of the software and therefore they have no, they have no grip on that. I love that. Okay. So that's huge in the video game space, technical uh, talent in the video game space. So they're going to lock you down with an NDA. They're going to lo uh, lock you down with a non-compete, um, all of these things. And that's not bad. This is not a villainous thing. I just kind of right. want to say it's just common. It's just common. This is not like big, bad corporate. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's big, bad corporate also, but that's not just yeah. it. So what I really love about that suggestion is that this is a way to expand your portfolio, uh, build a community that doesn't risk uh, violating any of that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, then you have your community. Um, what this is a, another thing that I've seen specifically with the gaming community that open source or Creative Commons, um, it, whether it, whether it's a you know tabletop or whether it's a, a piece of fiction or piece of art, is something that really drums up community in a way that. You would you wouldn't expect. So, how has since we're on the subject, have you carried that over into the game crafter, or maybe even into your uh, video game work? 
Have I carried over open source into these open things? Open source or how do you build community? So open source okay. was the method that you used for software, but what are some sure. of the community building that you've done in your other avenues? Um, yeah, well, I, OK, let's talk uh, two different angles then. We'll talk about the Game Crafter and Lacuna Expanse. So the Game Crafter we already talked about. It's the print-on-demand uh, thing for making board games. Um, with that, uh, the community kind of naturally builds because I'm not actually building a thing that people can buy. I'm building a service that people can use. And so uh, as they use the service, and if they like the service, they automatically kind of become my built-in community and fan base and evangelists and that sort of stuff. So it's very organic in that regard. It's word of mouth. In fact, we spend almost nothing on advertising. Uh, we spend quite a bit on um uh, on viral marketing, essentially. So basically, it means we go to conventions, we build uh, communities around um, about, around social networking and doing cool things online. We build communities by paying our customers to actually go to conventions and run and play their board games at conventions, have a booth at a convention. We actually pay our customers to do that, and that brings loyalty and that brings fan following, right? Um, what other company do you know that actually pays their customers to go do stuff that they wanted to do anyway? Right, um, right. And you also, um, I've seen this all over, th this is great viral marketing, um, all over that you mm -hmm. provide a lot of free game piece game pieces to conventions for people to make their own stuff. Uh, yep. You do a lot of donations and that's, in a way, that's open sourcing because you're like, Here's all, here are all my pieces, do your thing, um, yep. but know who know who helped you with that or know, know who provided that that service for free yeah uh, it's a it's actually two things there that that particular thing is awesome because um we're donating we, we donate a lot of game pieces like plastic bits and metal bits and all that kind of stuff but we also donate a lot of blanks and so people can design their own cards or whatever they can draw on it or their own game boards or mats or whatever and those blanks are actually part of our waste stream so um, really? it's, the left, okay. it's the leftover stuff. Like we cut 18 cards on a sheet, right? So if somebody only needed 17 cards, there's a blank card on that sheet. We actually save that and then we donate that to conventions. And so we're by, by giving it to the convention and then somebody taking it home and making something out of it, it's green because it's not ending up in a landfill anywhere. It's, it's being used. Um, and then on top of that, it's helping out people, giving them a free resource that they can use to explore their game design ideas, you know, and they're not having to sink a bunch of money into buying blanks, that sort of thing. Wow, that's so. fantastic. I didn't know that, that aspect of it. Um, yeah. How about um, the video game? The video game. So the video game is called Lacuna Expanse. I built that uh, a number of years ago, back in 2010. Uh, and in around 2011 or 2012, I actually open sourced the whole thing, the server, everything, um, uh, and the iPhone app, the whole nine yards, everything is open source and it's still going and it's still making me money, even though I have open sourced the whole thing. Um, the, uh, it didn't start out open source though. I built it using a language that a lot of people have thought is kind of an old dead language called Perl. Uh, but it actually had a renaissance a number of years ago, and now it has uh, all the modern features you'd expect in any kind of modern programming language. So it's really super powerful because it has this rich history of 25 years of development, plus it has all the modern features of modern programming languages. So you end up with the kind of best of both worlds. You have modern features and you have modern, uh, or and you have this giant library of um, modules that will let you connect to anything, essentially. Um, so anyway, I built the game on that language and that language, the community behind that language is very active. They, um, anytime you do something cool with that language, they spread the word about it like wildfire. And so when I published this game and I said it was written in Perl, the entire Perl community, millions of developers around the world got behind me. Said, look how amazing it is. And that whole thing. So that's, I actually used this community that I had built a reputation in through WebGUI because I built Web. Um, I built a reputation through WebGUI and then took that reputation and parlayed it by getting the Perl community involved to help me promote the game. And that's how I initially got the, the initial few thousand people 
playing the game. Wow. Okay. I, I did not know about that. That's really cool information. I, what I do want to do is kind of rewind back into the web GUI, because this is kind of going to travel with, with the, the programming, and say, okay, uh, you have contractors that are, that, you, that are part of your community. Um, you are paying them off of, from the clients that you have. When did you decide to incorporate and make that an, an official thing uh, versus a lot of you know, people getting around to, to do projects? Uh, so let's see. I started web GUI in, I don't even remember when I started web GUI. I think it was in 2000 and it was around January of 2001 when I created uh, Plain Black. So it wasn't very long after I had launched WebGUI that I started playing black. And a lot of that had to do with, I just needed a place where I could put stuff. I needed a domain. So I figured it's not that expensive to buy a domain and to register a company somewhere. So I did that. And, um, and at first, Plain Black's website was all it was, was uh, here's the link to download WebGUI and here's the documentation for it. That's it. There was That's nothing awesome. else there. Um, and then eventually I put in some contact information so that people could email me if they, you know, had a question or whatever and, and went on from there. Okay. So. Um, well, there's a section where I want to talk about how you started Plain Black and the Game Crafter. It looks like they started both in the same year. Um, but <laughs> before we jump into, into that, um, the, the outlier seems to be the video game. So can you tell me more about that video game? Where did that idea come from? You, uh, did you start off with it being a, an IP that you then released uh, in, in Pearl to everyone? How did that work? The video game actually came about because um, I wanted to make a video game. It was ah, just that simple. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> uh, and and actually, I had built other video games before that, um, not to the kind of large extent that Lacuna is this massive sprawling game, lots of and lots of features um, in it. But yeah, uh, it says the other it's games casual. Uh, when I went through and I started, that is not casual, my friend. That there's like <laughs> dials and knobs, and it's just like ah, I I know some wizarding friends that will be very passionate about that. I'm not even sure how to get past the tutorial. It it it's a uh, it's a big game. Yeah. Uh, it was meant to be casual originally, and I sort of <laughs> let the thing go a little bit. Um, it's casual in the sense that it is not a war game. Like okay. a lot of a lot of games are made made to battle, and there's plenty of battling that you can do in there. But mostly, it's a civilization game. So mostly, it's about negotiating with people, diplomacy, building out your empire, taking over planets, all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, so I wanted to build a game. So I uh, and my par business partners thought that was a good idea. So I took a year off from playing black and I built the game. Um, and the the impetus behind it was twofold. One, because I wanted to build a game. But two, because I wanted to learn a bunch of new technologies that I had no reason to learn as part of WebGUI. There was nothing in WebGUI that was going to make me use any of these new things. Um, and so the game gave me a real world project to apply these new technologies and figure out how they worked and what they were. And uh, so it was for me, it was, it's the best kind of education is applying some knowledge to a real project. So, right that's, now, uh, that's it. so you started the video game. Uh, there are a lot of listeners that are, you know, indie video game devs and they have some experience. Maybe they went to school specifically for game design. You just mm -hmm. decided that you wanted to make a game. Now there's a lot of components in there. How did you traverse the soundtrack? How did you get the um, the the visuals put together? I know that you had the platform with Pearl that you were building in, so there's some familiarity there. But how did you right. overcome those other technical challenges? Well, I've been designing games for a long time, board games and role playing games and that sort of stuff. So the game design element was. Uh, kind of second nature at that point, you know, figuring out how the different systems work together. And because this is an empire builder, empire builders generally you can figure out with a spreadsheet if you build a most a complicated enough spreadsheet. Okay. And so that's what I did. I built a spreadsheet to figure out, you know, what are the values of all these different things and what are my formulas and that sort of thing. Uh, as far as bringing in the talent for the other aspects of it, like the 3D rendering and all that kind of stuff, um, it was as simple as going out to the web and doing some searching. I, you know, I used, um, I think it was Elance 
is what I used to find the 3D modeler that actually did the, the rendering. We don't actually have a soundtrack per se. There's a few musical bits that people have put together over, uh, over the years, fans have put together, but there's no sounds in the game. It's just a purely web game uh, that a lot of people play at work, honestly. So having sounds would be a bad thing. <laughs> that is awesome. And uh, Elance is a, a great, great site. Um, so that will be included. And that's just a, a platform for outsourcers uh, that, you, that right. you agree on a rate and they do work for you. Uh, great platform. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak to the outsourcing uh, and its effects on kind of multiplying your time? I know that a lot of people say, you know, I have no money. I have to do everything myself, including right, uh, uh, drawing uh, pixelated um, uh, sprites. And I have no you know, art design, but I have no money. I can't do it. Uh, how, how do they get around that? Well, there are multiple ways to get around it. Um, and so a lot of people say they have no money and they actually do have quite a bit of money. They just don't know that they do or don't think about it in that way. So uh, one thing is that a lot of people spend a lot of money on doodads. You know, they're buying DVDs and computers and jewelry and whatever. Um, if you put away some of those doodads, you start living less. You know, uh, your entire budget could be, you know, a, a few thousand dollars a year. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be your entire paycheck. Um, so even now, like I live a very nice life, um, it, it, you know, in a very nice house and I have a maid service that cleans uh, a couple times or every other week. And, you know, by all accounts, it's a pretty nice life. My entire cost of living is less than $20,000 a year. Wow. So, right. And that is, that's including food and insurance and everything because I've paid off all of my bills. I don't have a mortgage to have to pay. I don't have, you know, uh, whatever the doodads are that people are paying off because I have lived a minif minified lifestyle because I don't need those doodads. I want to do cool things. Um, so my wife and I are both of that, that we would rather have cool experiences than have things. Um, and so we spend our money on either like in my case, I spend my money a lot on business, but, uh, uh, but, uh, together we spend our money on, uh, like vacations and things like that. Cause we want to go out and do things. Um, but anyway, so a lot of people have money and they're just spending it on the wrong stuff. And so that's the, that's the good starting point right there. Um, if you truly do not have any money, then there are other ways you could get a loan from friends or family. Uh, you can, see if you can find a venture capitalist that will float you some money. You can see if you can get an artist or a sound person who wants a stake in the company. So you say, you know, I'm going to give you a uh, 25% share in the company for your sweat equity. Um, there are lots of different avenues that you can uh, that you can go with in the, along those lines. Um, I, I've done when I was really young, I was uh, not even 18. I did my first game. Um, and I worked with an artist who I did a share with where he got, um, the product I was selling was $20. And for every copy that I sold, he got $2, regardless of what I made on it. You know, if I, if, even if I made nothing on it, he still got $2. So he was always, uh, he was always getting, uh, some money. So over the course of that, um, that project, I sold a thousand copies of the game and he made $2,000, but it took him a while. He would have gotten that 2000 up front had I had it, but I didn't have it. So I made him this deal and, uh, he was cool with that. So, um, it just depends, you know, what your yeah. situation is. So I, I want to add one other option uh, to that. And, uh, that is, you could get a job. Um, to, <laughs> it's horrible advice. Like people get very upset. Um, but if you have a skill or trade or something that you can get paid well for, um, when you're talking about that minimized lifestyle, that's another subject that isn't super duper popular, but, um, I loved that you gave a concrete dollar amount, uh, value of, of how you're living lean, um, for the, the gaming careers podcast. Um, I had a, a, uh, an outsourced marketer that did some fantastic work for me for about six months. And I think it cost me like 150 bucks, mm -hmm. um, over the course of six months. And if oh, you can't. Yeah. 
if you can't scrounge 150 bucks over six months, um, there's a completely different problem happening, and that's yeah. you know, lights on, and you're eating ramen and beans, and you know maybe right. maybe backtrack a couple steps, figure out the basics of life. Maybe you've made made some bad life life choices. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, and we want to empower bad life choices. We all have made them, but uh, still, if you're wanting to, uh, I guess the the point there is this next thing, this next entrepreneurial venture, is maybe not the first priority at that point right mm -hmm. okay um so i love that you you uh took this video game project and you're like hey i'm going to use the skills i need and you already had the experience outsourcing um and kind of made that happen again releasing the open source code all right mm -hmm. now let's jump into the two companies you started 2001 you did both uh how did you manage to get game crafter up and running and operating well uh while at the same time you were you were uh running the um web gui company i cheated <laughs> okay so love um, it <laughs> no uh the game crafter was a hobby business in 2001 it was not uh what it is today it was simply a, a mechanism via which i could publish the board games that i was designing at the time so there was almost nothing to it um, it was just, you know, whatever time I had in my spare time, whatever money I had, you know, spare to that I could spare, that sort of thing. It wasn't a full-time gig or anything. It was just, you know, uh, a hobby business. And playing black was a full-time job, and so was working at Brunswick. So I was still putting in, you know, 90 hours a week. It was just that maybe one of them was going to uh, the crafter. And how how long did you work with the Hydra headed monster that you had to do those three different things? Uh, for two years or three years? I don't know. It was a it was a number of years. Um, All right. But, and I, uh, I wanted to ask that question because um, I have a lot of people that you know write into the show um, mm -hmm. and want to know where they find the time. And this is a similar answer to the money. It, mm -hmm. You can work more. Mm -hmm. You can. you can. You like 90 hours. I have uh, some corporate background experience as well. And it, a 60 to 90 hour work weeks are not an uncommon thing. And they also are survivable for a period oh, yeah. of time. Mm -hmm. You know, and so go ahead. It's, yeah, it's exactly like you said, it's exactly the same thing as the money. You're, you spend your money on doodads. A lot of people spend their time on doodads as well. They are watching TV or they are working on projects that aren't benefiting the thing that they actually want to do. If you're, if you want to start a business, then maybe you need to give up your hobbies of, you know, flying kites or whatever it is that you're into. So, um, it's just, you know, you have to set priorities. What's the most important thing and you'll be able to do it because there's a lot of hours in a week. So there are, and, and you are awake for more of them than you, than you think. Um, I recently, <laughs> uh, released a, a show actually it was today as of when we were, um, when we're recording, um, with Cam Adair, who is somebody that helps people with video game addiction. And, um, what I found interesting about that show and it pertains to our conversation right here is the amount of time that you can reclaim if you want to, if you want to prioritize your time differently. Um, and one of the biggest barriers to making a video game can be playing video games, <laughs> right? Because Absolutely. you're, you're Absolutely. playing all of these games and you're like, oh my gosh, oh, they should they should do the level like this. Or, you know, I, I'm so good at, I got the Twitch down. I'm like, I'm there. Wouldn't it be cool if I, if I could make a game like that? When all of that right. time while you're playing is time that you could be learning to code, time that, that you could be learning pixel art, time that you could be collaborating with a community that can give you an in on your first project. Right. Yep. And honestly, you don't necessarily have to give up those things. Think about the amount of downtime. Let's say, let's say you're an avid TV watcher, right? Uh, think about the amount of downtime there is in watching TV. Either A, there's commercial breaks or something along those lines, or B, there are lots of moments in a show that you don't need to actually watch. You can simply listen. So imagine that you're trolling your customer forums and replying to customer service emails while you're watching uh, you, you know, while you're watching your favorite episode of the arrow or whatever. So you don't have to, and the same thing goes with a lot of video games too, especially if you're playing MMOs, there's tons of time where you're just walking from someplace to someplace else. <laughs> and you can absolutely be doing two things at the same time.
Right, right. So. And um, that's that's great advice as well. Um, I am, I, I'll have some more to talk about on the show at some point about this, but I'm in the middle of an experiment, uh, which is uh, 90 days with no media. So it's no, uh, no TV, no video games, no uh, uh, Netflix, no Prime, all of that. Um, that would be awful. It's, it is awful. Yes, yes, it is awful. Uh, here's what I have found. So uh, just a brief um, foreshadowing on some time where I talk about it. Um, I was so bored for the first week. I was just sitting in silence at night on my couch with nothing to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wicked bored. Had no, I had no model with which to use my time if I wasn't doing one of these other things. Um, and then the next week, um, I finished a book. Uh, I did three more complete uh, prototype overhauls on the on the card game I'm working on. Uh, I was like, oh my gosh, it took me six months to do this before, and now I did it in a week. Huh, yep. there's something to this. More on that later. But uh, it's, it's more time than you think, audience. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so um, how did Game Crafter slowly take up more and more of your time uh, into kind of the amount of time that it takes now? Uh, it wasn't slow at all. It was um, it was basically a decision. In 2008, I pr- approached my business partners and said, hey, we should do this. And then that's where we turned the Game Crafter into this ho- from this hobby business into what it is today. Um, so in about four months, we had written the basic code and uh, and deployed it, and then it started taking off. Um, now, from that point to the point where we are now has been a very slow and gradual type of process. Uh, you know, I, I still, for the first two or three years of the Game Crafter, I was still doing mostly plain black stuff and very little Game Crafter stuff. Uh, and then somewhere around that three-year mark, uh, it switched, and I stopped doing... Um, actually in between there, I was working on Lacuna now that I think about it. Okay. So it started with for 2000, a little bit of 2008 and a little bit of 2009, I was working on the game crafter to get it off the ground. Then I went back to plain black. Then in 2010, I quit both of those and was working on Lacuna for a little over a year. And then I went back and worked on plain black for a few months. And at that point, I decided that the Game Crafter was what needed my attention, and so went to nearly full time on the Game Crafter, uh, along with you know some of the other businesses that I had created in between. But okay, so um, I I want that <laughs> spreadsheet of the distribution of how you spend your time. Um, do you play any of the games that you, that you make? Absolutely. In a oh my gosh. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I and I play other games, uh, you know, that I don't make, and I watch pl- plenty of TV. This goes back to, this goes back to that thing about there's way more time than people think there is, uh, and part of it is, I mean, okay, admittedly, one of my superpowers is that I'm an insomniac. Um, I don't sleep that much, and I don't need that much sleep in order to function. So that helps me compared to other normal people who have to sleep, you know, eight or 10 or 12 hours, whatever it is that they sleep. Um, Especially when I was younger, I used to sleep three to four hours a night and be fine. Uh, And that was, you know, just normal if I slept at all. And uh, now as I'm getting older, it's more like six hours to seven hours, something like that. So it's approaching a normal amount of sleep, but that's if I sleep but I'm an insomniac. But that said, um, even if you're not an insomniac, you, even if you sleep, that still leaves a metric crap ton of time that you have, uh, you know, during the day that you can do all kinds of amazing stuff. So um, that's it. Cool. It's that simple, and and yet it is very difficult for us to do. Um, so to to uh, redeem our time in that way. Uh, so I, I do want to kind of pepper in some of those other projects because there are other companies that you've done, other other things that you have going. Um, but let's focus on the Game Crafter just for a second here and, and zoom in. There's a couple of cool things I want to highlight. First of all, um, the Game Crafter is not just a website when you go to it. It's this kind of right. kind of completely interactive app that helps you online build your game. That's the one thing I want to talk about a little bit more. And then the other thing is you have like robots and and the (laughs) the next generation human 2.0 building these games for you um, in in your workshop. Can you tell me about both of those? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, okay, so the app is, you're right. It's, we don't build the website as if it's a website. We build it as if it's an app. Um, so it happens to be deployed via the web rather than turned into an executable that you have to download to your computer and install it. But we, we very much take the idea that it should function as a desktop app. So you're dragging and dropping things and uh, you're interacting with, you know, there's a real time chat service that's built into the whole thing. And, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's constantly in motion, even when you're not, because there's stuff in the process, in the background that's processing. And then little notifications will be popping up, letting you know that, Hey, this thing is done, whatever it is that it was doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, we took that as a, as an approach simply because of the amount of stuff that we have to do. Uh, you know, people are uploading these massive files, for example, uh, you know, a single game board image might be a hundred megabytes just for one image on the thing. Oh, wow. And so, so, you know, imagine if we were processing that in real time, um, you know, as the person is interacting with it, if they had to wait and they couldn't do anything while, while that was, you know, processing in the background, as I'm taking a thumbnail of it or something like that. So basically I upload it and then go do the processing stuff and the person can continue working in the app, uploading other things or whatever. And then I send a little notification, Hey, this is done now. It's ready to go. Um, so it's a practicality measure making this whole thing, uh, work in this kind of asynchronous manner because there's all these components that you need to put together. Um, so while you're uploading the 152 cards that are in your game deck, for example, you can start, labeling all of them and doing whatever you want to do. You know, if you want to proof them, for example, you need to be able to see that they're going to cut correctly. So you can be proofing them while the other ones are uploading and all of that stuff is going on simultaneously because, uh, and you can be chatting with the other people in the chat room <laughs> because all of this stuff, you're, you're, it's a chaotic mess. All of the things you have to put together for designing a game. So, right. So that's kind um, of why we built it. This. All right. So on that, um, is this something that, you know, you started back in 2001, you kind of learned how you would want to build your game or what kind of interface that you wanted um, and then added features over time that made this happen? Or was there like a grand plan? There's just a lot of moving parts. And I was wondering if you did like any market research with gamers or whether you are one and that's how you, you uh, did it. How'd that happen? Yeah, I didn't do any. In the first iteration, we just built the thing based on what I thought I needed. Um, and that was TGC 1.0. We're on TGC 4. Point something now. I don't remember exactly. But um, between 1.0 and 2.0, it was a complete rewrite. We gutted it and started from scratch. Oh, wow. um, and that was because of all the stuff we had learned about what we did wrong the first time. Uh, so the, our market research was, we'll just whip up an app and see what happens. And uh, it And we did. And then we figured out what we actually needed to do. So then we went back and rewrote the whole thing. And then everything since 2.0 has been natural progression of people asking us for this or that. And so we're evolving the same app and we just keep evolving and adding and evolving and adding. Okay. So. Uh, well, I, what I like about that is that the first version of the the game crafter was something that you did actually have to completely rework i know that um, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time on the drawing board in analysis paralysis um mm -hmm. afraid to actually get anything out there and um that's not the approach that you took how long did it take for you to actually launch your initial version one version one we had one person working on it it wasn't me because i was busy with other stuff at the time i had one developer working on it for a period of two months to write it and then another two months of testing and uh tweaking with graphic designers and all that kind of stuff so it was a four month process the first time uh and then for version 2.0 i spent another i think it was five months maybe six uh rewriting it and adding a whole bunch of features and then writing the whole um export system that would transition it from one platform to the other so that all of everybody's uh, art assets and that sort of stuff would come over automatically to the new the new system okay so um is a and this is maybe impossible to answer because every software project is different but you know less than a year sort of timeline in order to get an iteration out and get feedback is that a realistic expectation Oh yeah. I, um, these days actually I have a different thing. It has to be, I have to have minimum viable product in a month. Um, MVP what? is a standard term. 
that yes. gets thrown around. I don't know if your users know it, but uh, minimum viable product is what is something that's working enough that you can sell it. Um, so I generally, and granted, I've built a, myself a whole suite of tools so that I can build apps that quickly now. So you've, your average developer may not be able to pull that off because they might not have all the infrastructure they need to be able to do that. But because I have this whole toolkit that I've been building for years, um, I can whip up an app and have MVP in a month. Um, and then from there, I try to take off bite-sized chunks. Every bite is a one day's worth of work. So if I have to, um, if it's a feature that's going to take more than one day, I break up those features into multiple bite-sized chunks that is one day or less. So okay, it helps, that, it helps me with my project management process. Ah, wonderful. That actually was uh, kind of a lead into what I was going to ask about. So you use a, a byte system. That's the verbology you use. Do you right. use sprints at all? I don't, actually. So I've worked in environments that use, uh, you know, the standard project management models, actually several of them. Um, and for me, that's a lot of paperwork that doesn't lead to success, um, mainly because uh, people don't know how to estimate anything. And that is so true. And so it doesn't matter how good your project management process is if you can't estimate anything. And the reason people are terrible at estimating things is because they have no, um, they, they try to take these giant pieces and call that a project, you know, or this is a task. And the task is too big. You got to break it down into something you know you can get done in a reasonable amount of time. And so that's where the bite sized chunks come in. Um, and at that point, then project management's job, all it should be is communicating between the different moving parts. Uh, it shouldn't actually be all the kind of task mastery type things that go into most project management systems. If you have a good estimate and everybody knows what the different chunks are that they're working on, then project management is a breeze. So That is true. And um, developers generally respond very poorly to task management oversight. That's also true. That's very, very true. Don't bother the developers. Um, so <laughs> the one point that I want to say about the MVP is when you said um, cranking that out in a month so that you can sell it, um, mm -hmm. the selling part is often in somebody else's category and they're experts at that. I've worked with mm -hmm. some amazing sales teams that can sell off of an idea and PowerPoint. And if it can do mm -hmm. something close, that's sellable. So when we're talking about yeah. minimum viable product, it's not the polished pretty thing with the, the modals that right. all kind of smooth and sound. No, it's mm -hmm. what could you present in front of a kindergarten class? Yep. All it's, right. It doesn't have to have many, many bells and whistles at that point. It's just, can it do a basic function? Can it solve a problem? So that's it. absolutely. All right. So um, human 2.0 robots, robots, right? Robots. <laughs> So I don't talk much about the robots because, well, They're I don't sensitive. talk much about the robots. Um, it is sensitive. But um, what I can say is that uh, we do have a lot of robots at the Game Crafter that do various functions. Uh, some of them are off the shelf robots that you can just buy to do stuff. Um, and uh, some of them are stuff that we've had to build or customize in some way. A lot of times, so the thing that we do there aren't a lot of people in the world that do what we do. In fact, there are none. Um, so the machines don't exist uh, to do what we do for the most part. So we have to find something that does something similar or close. And then if we can modify it in some way to make it work for our process, that works. Um, we have, there is a competitor that uh, that's out there that does everything by hand. And I can't imagine how they do that. <laughs> like they manufacture everything by hand cutting everything. And uh, so we don't do that. Um, <laughs> wow. But uh, yeah. So anyway, um, they produce, you know, they measure their orders in the thousands per year. We made 86,000 games last year. Whoa. Um, there's no way we could do 86,000 games with a handful of people if we didn't have robots doing most of the heavy lifting. So, okay. So there's an entrepreneurial subject in here that I kind of want to hit on, which is you're creating something that doesn't exist. So you're, you're not letting a technology essentially limit your, your objectives that you're trying to accomplish. How, how do you go about doing that? Like you say, how I want to have a fully X, Y, Z product. And somebody says, well, that doesn't exist. Uh, you're like, okay, I don't care. I'll, I'll go build it. 
Well, that's the that's the first start is you can't care what people say. Um, <laughs> you just have to know whether or not you can pull it off. And it really comes down to the power of the possible. Like a lot of people, a lot of people don't have the vision to see that something could exist if they just looked at it a different way. Uh, and so that's that's it. Whether it be you know taking a machine and modifying it to do what you want it to do, you know the robots that we that we have, or it just writing a piece of software that didn't exist, you know scratching an itch. The game crafter didn't exist until I invented it, so there was no way to produce one copy of a board game uh, except by hand prior to the game crafter existing back in two thousand nine, and so out of thin air, I have created that. And now people can do that. And like I said, last year, we made 86,000 games. So a lot of people are doing that. And that's the thing that a good business does is it finds this niche that, you know, there's there's an itch out there waiting to be scratched. And if you find it, that's that's where you can make money. Awesome. So I this is in my, you know, questions to ask. And it, um, it sounds like that, were somebody trying to take down JT and like take the game, game crafter out, you have a fair lead in the market. You're doing things that nobody else does. You have a little bit of secret sauce on how that happens. Um, you you own the platform for it. And, and so far, as far as I, I can find, nobody's coming close. That's true. Uh, we have a pretty strong lead. That doesn't mean that somebody couldn't come out of the woodwork, but um, there's another advantage in that uh, the board game market is fairly small compared to most business markets. So there aren't a lot of venture capitalists that will give you a million dollars to do something. They want to give you 10 million or a hundred million to do something. And it's uh, because the board game market is small, they're never going to make back a hundred million if they were to give it to you. Right. <laughs> so, um, so that helps us because that's the other way that normally somebody comes in and destroy or disrupts a market. If you if you prove the market out, then somebody will come in and try and and try and copy you because there's money to be made. But venture capitalists won't touch it because they're looking for big deals. And the game crafter is amazing, but it's not a hundred million dollar a year business. Uh, so there's just no way venture capital is going to be a threat. So then it comes back to somebody that wants to build stuff organically and we've already got the we've already got the community, we've already got this process in place, we've got a lot a, a big lead uh, in user base, that sort of thing. So it's it's hard for people to compete and I think that's a good thing for us. Um, but well, sure. it doesn't mean but it doesn't mean we can't lose it, right? Uh, if we just start screwing up, if we stop caring about our customers, then that leaves open an opportunity for somebody else to come in and, and take ground from us. And so we're constantly competing against ourselves. We're always putting out a new product and you know we put out 20, 30, 40 new products a year at the Game Crafter just so that we can constantly improve what we're doing or we'll refine existing products, that sort of thing. So um, anyway, we, we're not standing still just because we don't have competitors. Right. And I can speak to that as, as well, just by, by way of experience with uh, watching the Game Crafter over time. At one point, there was some question about some quality on some components. Then over time, you, you tie that up and you, you wrap it up. You make a new product. You, make, uh, you do a switch out and tool something, and it's, and it's better. And so what I really love about the Game Crafter is that you're so responsive to the community about what they're saying. And you're like, okay, that's valid. I'm going to go fix that. Right. Yeah. If we were like, ah, that's not a problem, then we'd be out of business. And well, we're um, like, we're the only, we're the only show in town, man. Deal. Yeah. Where else are you going to go? You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but really, I mean, we care, uh, partially because we're also gamers. You know, I, I'm a game designer. I use the service. It's like hair club for men, right? I'm not just the president. I also am a, a user and that's true here. I use the service. So I want it to be better for myself too. So it's not, it's not just this altruistic thing. It's also a greedy thing. I want this. I want a better service so I can use it. And that's why the Game Crafter exists in the first place is because nothing like it existed. So I decided to create it. So, right, um, right. That's it. All right. So zooming out a little bit, since you have been, I have touted you as the expert in all of these categories. Um, <laughs> whether you wanted to or not. Now, um, because you've been in both <laughs> uh, video games, uh, 
board games. Uh, you've, you've made your own board games, which we will talk about in a little bit, um, and also done the entrepreneur bit. Where should somebody start? Should they, you know, what is the most financially viable to be able to kind of work on a bunch of side projects? Um, if you're just graduating high school or college, starting off designing just board games uh, is maybe a challenge, if you can speak to that. <laughs> Oh, uh, man, breaking into any entertainment industry is ridiculously tough because a lot of people want to do it, right? Um, and there's only really money in it if you make it really, really big. Before that, there's nothing. You're a waiter or a waitress, you know, working in Hollywood. Um, that is that is the nature of any entertainment industry, whether you want to be a professional football player or an actor in Hollywood or a game designer. The same thing is true. Um so getting a foothold in the industry is probably the most viable way to make a living at it is to go work for someone else who is already successful. So go get your job, get a foot in the door at a game publishing company or a game producer or a game distributor. Work as a salesperson at a game distributor, for example. You'll get to know the industry, you'll get to meet a lot of contacts, and then maybe eventually you can get a job at some other place in the game industry. Um, so I would say that would be a good... Um, a good way to get a foothold. As a game designer, uh, unless you have a hit on your hands, there's almost no money. In fact, you, I mean, when you add up the number of hours that you're putting into a game design versus what you get out of it, you're working for literally pennies an hour. Um, if that, you know, you might lose money. <laughs> so uh, the game designer route um, is more of a happenstance. If you happen to hit it out of the park and get your game, you know, either a really massive Kickstarter or get your game seated with a publisher that does really well with it, yeah, maybe you can make some money with it. I know a few people that make, you know, thousands of dollars a year. They can actually live off of um, the money that they make from board game design, but almost nobody. It's like a handful of people that do that. So, um, uh, don't I wouldn't say game design is your is your foothold into the industry if you're looking to make money. It is a decent way to get your art out there and to um, and by art I don't mean just visual stuff. I mean the creative aspect of designing games, and then also uh, to get your name out there. So um, you know go go run a successful Kickstarter even if you're not making a billion dollars off of it. You're making a name for yourself, and it's a way to get a name into the industry, which eventually might get you picked up by publishers, or it might get you a job somewhere. Um, you know, and for if for no reason, you know, you're going to a lot of conventions and having fun, and uh, you'll make connections with people that you can then use later to establish yourself further. So, right, right. Okay, so I, I really appreciate all of the uh, time and experience that you've shared. Uh, do you have any kind of go-to resources that you would share with our audience in the game designer space that you've enjoyed? Hmm. Well, I mean, the game crafter community, honestly, is is where it's at as far as game design. If you're looking for any kind of advice, get in there. There's also great stuff on board game geek, geek or bgdf.com or the tabletop game design subreddit. There's all kinds of cool stuff like that. And there's links to all that stuff on the game crafter slash help. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're looking to get into business, I think one of the first things that people need to understand is how money works because no schools teach it. They might teach you how to balance your checkbook or do some basic accounting, but how money works, uh, you know, how to read a balance sheet, that sort of thing. You need to do that if you're going to run a business. And honestly, if you're going to run a Kickstarter, that's running a business for at least a year. So um, I would say one of the best resources out there in a concise format is a book by Robert Kiyosaki called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yes. A, yeah. Sorry, got excited. <laughs> no, it's exciting. It's a good, it's a good book and it'll teach you how to understand the basics of money. And from there, there's lots of other books that you can get into. Yeah, but, and it's, um, and it's funny that you mentioned that because I've mentioned on the show a number of times that I was in my MBA class and um, all of a sudden I was playing a board game that um, clicked for me and like, oh my gosh, all of the stuff I'm learning on the board game is what I'm learning about in my MBA and that will help me out. And it was cash flow by uh, 101 by Robert Kiyosaki. Big fan. Yep. Uh, that, when you said doodads, I was like, oh, it's, it's jargon. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, JT, um, what can you tell us about 
what you're working on, whether it's uh, one of your board games or what's exciting new coming from the Game Crafter, and where can we find out more about that? Okay. Uh, let's see. I've got a number of things. Uh, coming up in about a month, I have a new Kickstarter called um, Hamlet Builder Pro. It's a little city building game um, where all kinds of crazy stuff keeps happening, like orc attacks and thieving uh, gnomes and things like that. Um, but anyway, that'll be on Kickstarter uh, September 16th, so people can look out for that. Um, uh, in business, I am actually starting another company right now um, called Tabletop Events. Uh, Tabletop.events is the domain. It's not. Uh, it's just a splash page up right now because it's in private beta. But um, it is a, uh, a an event management system for the board game industry to run conventions because uh, back to scratching that itch, um, I've been to a lot of conventions as be becoming, you know, part, part of the game crafter. And one inalienable truth is that most of them have no technology behind them. They're very poorly run because they just don't have the organizational tools. So we want to provide those organizational tools and that's where tabletop events is going to come in. That is fantastic. And I, I've had the opportunity to talk to some, um, uh, convention runners and they're, they're talking about all of this manual process and yeah, I, it blows my mind. I think there's definitely a need for that. Right. Yep. JT, thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolutely incredible hour and uh, I hope to have you on again. I know we just scratched the surface on a bunch of things. Yeah, I'd love to come back on again. Thank you for having me.